Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and today we are so excited to have Marley Dias with us. You know her as an author, activist, executive producer, and the founder of 1000 Black Girl Books. Of course you know her, even though she's still in high school. I mean, we've known her since she was, you know, much younger. Marley, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You, you, are, you are a marvel and an inspiration to every single Black girl in, the, in this country. Uh, I was asking you before we just started about the update on the 1,000 books, and where are you now? We are currently at 13,000 books. It has been a wild ride, and I'm, you know, this is crazy. I thought 1,000 was too much. My mom wrote it for 1,000, and now we're at 13,000. Incredible, incredible. And talk, talk to us a little bit about the program, where the books have gone, what the, you know, and, 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 and what the impact is. So the 1000 Black Girl Books campaign started in 2015 out of my frustration with the lack of diversity in the books assigned at my school. Um, and the original goal was to collect 1000 books and we've now donated over 1000 books to schools in Jamaica and Atlanta, Connecticut, Philadelphia, uh, New Jersey, all over New Jersey, uh, Jamaica, Ghana, Haiti, and it's been really exciting. And even the places that we don't get to donate books, we always want to encourage people to remember that this is about, you know, literacy and the importance of diversity, but also encouraging kids to know that they can change the world too. So even if we don't always have that opportunity, I love to, you know, speak to kids, come to schools, and encourage them to realize that you don't need to wait. You don't need to wait to start thinking, to start being curious, to start valuing, you know, research and history and journalism and activism, and that anything you love to do can help others. So tell me a little bit about the reaction. I know you've talked with some of these girls uh, about the impact for them personally, about, you know, about seeing themselves in print. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what they've said to you. What, what was surprising about what you learned from their reactions? Well, I think it's really interesting, especially on my first trip where I donated books to Jamaica, a country that is majority Black, that they often did not have stories where Black girls were the main characters. Now, I, as a, a minority in my town and my school district, assumed that it was just because there were majority white people and white teachers and they would, you know, assign books about their experiences. But thinking about even when I go to Jamaica and Ghana, how much of the imagery surrounding what's beautiful, what's smart, what is intelligent, is still the images of white people. So that has been kind of the biggest thing for me overall is like how has this narrative really dominated even in spaces where your best friend, your neighbor, your family, they all look like you, but then the books that you read and the leaders you admire do not. I, uh, I often talk with people who uh, say to me, you know, every black family has a, the story that they tell their black sons, you know, about police encounters and, and all. And I said, I, I so seldom hear the story that Black families tell to their daughters. What story do you think that is? What cautionary tale from your experience doing this work now for several years have you, have you learned? I think one of the biggest cautionary tales I've learned from my mom, maybe it's just through, you know, having to lead and, and work in school, is not being communicative and trying to be to be strong in a way that feels inauthentic and not embracing the idea of using my, you know, my friends, my family supports and my resources that, you know, I want to feel like I've accomplished something great, but it doesn't mean at the expense of hurting my mind, always being tired, not wanting to do schoolwork, um, and that we need to form this balance because so many of the amazing black women that I look, look up to in history have worked so much solely by themselves and have become tired out and exhausted by that work. So as she's always encouraging me that you don't want to be burned out and feel that you've lost some of the value because you've spent too many sleepless nights or you've become too stressed and you don't have routines. So I think the biggest cautionary tale is making sure that I have balance. I mean, I'm, I'm 16 years old, so I don't need to be stressed right now, you know? I, I need to do things that I care about, but it should never be at the expense of my own body and my mind. I know the expectation is so high, right? It can be, especially when you're the only or the youngest, then that's when things can really get difficult because you feel like, well, I'm opening up a door for so many other people that look like me or maybe don't look like me, and I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to be the first and the worst. So I always try my best to, you know, set the bar high, but also not to be at the expense of, you know, my own, my own personal health. 
So, uh, you know, the country, as I say, you know, really probably puts more stress on black girls than any other uh, group. Uh, what, what do you see as that stress? I know some people say they think they tr think and they treat black girls as older, as adults, you know, as not small children. Uh, and we've seen the many encounters actually with the police, with young black girls. I mean, is that something that you're aware of, that your friends are aware of? And do you experience that at all? I'm definitely aware of it and it can feel very disheartening. I know some girls that are, you know, are more developed than me that experience sexualization by teachers, by friends, by other people in their lives. Um, and it's always, you know, boils down to the fact that the humanity of young black girls and women is not respected in the same way as other people's humanity. Uh, and that a lot of people are not actually inter in interest or in search of helping people and helping girls like us find that humanity and value it. Uh, be because we've grown up in a world where there is so often such negative imagery depicting or uh, only the way that we can value black struggles through pain and through strife that we don't see the happy moments of black girls lives we don't celebrate their hair their dancing their clothes and that we only care about black stories when they come from the most you know deprived and sad states you know we, we only hear about black experiences through the lens of the civil rights movement current day police brutality or through enslavement and to think about if these are the only ways that we're seeing black girls and black women and black people as a community, what do we think about who they are? Uh, and that they are not deserving of these pains, of these, these issues and the amount of things we've had to endure when we only share our stories through such an oppressive lens, I think it often comes down to the humanity not being valued uh, and black girls suffer a lot from that. Yeah, I, wanted to, I do wanna talk with you about the hair because that's, uh, you know, it's a thing that, um, you know, black girls, getting the hairstyle that they want, uh, that other people are telling them that they need. Uh, now cities and states are passing laws that say you can't discriminate against black girls because of their hairstyles. You know, I saw you talking at a Black Lives Matter rally with your, and I said, I want that hair. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get my hair to do that anymore, you know, but I tell you, I love it. You know, your, your hair is just magnificent. But talk with us about that barrier. I mean, some kids have been turned away at the schoolhouse door uh, and told, for the boys are told to get a haircut and the girls are told you can't have uh, locks, dreads here, anything. So it, it what an, uh, another, uh, you know, really tremendous weight that children should not have to bear. I completely agree that they should not have to bear it. I, one of my childhood best friends used to have to, she used to wear beads and she really liked wearing beads, but her teacher would tell her that she was too noisy or that they took up too much space or that they were distracting. And the same energy was never put towards, you know, shoes that glow or kids that just brought toys to school or any of these things. And it could be very frustrating. And I think, you know, in my own ways, I might have taken that into mind. I never wore beads because I didn't want to hear all these negative things. I never, you know, in some ways, I didn't want to step outside of the box and sometimes be free in my own hair because I felt like I just didn't want to hear what other people had to say about it. And, you know, that I still, at the end of the day, have not, you know, conformed to the idea of what a Black girl's hair should look like. But I do my best to, you know, uh, avoid telling people that, uh, avoid straightening my hair for work or things of that sort because I don't wanna reinforce any of the ideas that I might not care about my natural hair or I might not value them. And I think for a lot of young girls that look up to me, it's really cool when they get to see me wear an Afro and I think it helps me stand out. And the reason why I wear it, I'm not wearing one right now, but the reason why I have my hair in an Afro in the first place is because my dad used to have to take me to school and he would try to put my hair in a ponytail, but he could never hold it and get it right. So I would just take it out and wear my hair in an Afro. So it came out of a moment of like vulnerability and desperation at like eight years old where I, I just, I gave up and I was like, I guess I have to wear my hair in an afro. But you know, my parents had always encouraged me from the start to just do what makes me happy. Uh, right. And sometimes I might police that, but at the end of the day, I ended up just, I, and my dad could not do my hair how I wanted. So I had to improvise and now I'm stuck <laughs> with it. I know, so dad is responsible for a certain amount of the freedom. Right? Yeah, he is. He, he, I give him, that's the only thing I'll give him credit for is that he, he helped me, he forced me kind of to be more confident in that because it, he couldn't do it right, so. I know, that's, and there's that wonderful documentary, you know, the, the film about you know, a dad trying to do his daughter's. Yeah, hair love, it's very, it's very accurate to my own experiences. 
that that is tremendous. We need more dads talking about their daughters in every single way, and certainly about the hair, trying to get them ready for school uh, in the morning, as many of them should, more of them should be doing. <laughs> I, I want to talk about uh, Time magazine, which called you uh, one of the most influential teens, and that was in 2018. Uh, so my first did, year as a teenager yes <laughs> I know. What, what an extraordinary accomplishment how did it change your life suddenly you're 13 and you're one of the most influential ones well I think it shocked all my friends this was in eighth grade at the time that they didn't really know what I was doing like they just see oh she misses school she goes wherever whatever and I never explained it kind of fully what it meant to me how personal this uh this campaign is and they were like wow that's crazy wow like I think it was a huge wake-up call for people in my town and people that might just see me as like a, a smart student or as a friend or a neighbor to then realize that there was another level to this that there were people there were people that were recognizing what I do beyond just how I look or if I was you know adorable young girl or things like that but that there was you know value and substance in what I had to say so it's always really cool I was actually looking through stuff like that today because I have to for um, a program I'm applying for for my school I have to write down some of the things I've done and I'm like do I have to write this like this I never thought about and it, it kind of always blows my mind to think about the ways that I've been able to help other people and the things that I still want to do that I would love to as a you know adult when I'm 21 or anything to be on a list of you know the most influential people of that year as an adult like you know there are so many things that i i hope are ahead for me and it's also cool to reflect and think about how I, i've been able to do so much and hopefully more yeah so one of the other things that you probably wrote on uh, in the paper that's papers that you're filling out is that you actually have already spoken at the democratic national national convention yes i did write that and then uh, i did write that i don't want you to forget that one right <laughs> Tell us about that experience. That experience is very fun. I was hesitant at first because as a, a someone that can't vote and is, and I'm clearly, you know, I know what's going on in the world, but sometimes I don't want to get too sad or angry. So I don't pay as much attention to big political events. But um, my mom was like, well, they, this could be really cool. You know, a lot of people watch this and I've seen in the background, you know, and I get the its significance, but um, I, after meeting and talking to the people and saying that, you know, I wasn't interested in speaking about a specific candidate or condemning a specific person or praising a specific person, just talking about what we need from politicians to protect black girls lives and allow them to have freedoms uh, in the same way other people do, it was really, really powerful. So uh, it was it was super cool, especially because I was with teachers and farmers and people I had never met that were all interested at the end of the day and making sure that they're that we can change and create laws that are equitable, but also change the culture of the United States. That there are laws that say I'm equal to, you know, white men and white boys, but I don't experience that, you know? That's not part of my experience. And it was really awesome to be able to do that and to have my dad set up my, you know, little camera thing. And he was, he was excited because he felt like he was the producer of the event because he had to do all my lighting and whatever and whatever. My mom gets to do the hair and my aunts are get, getting to pick what was in my bookshelf behind me. It was like a whole family thing for us. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy I've been able to do it. Well, and you mentioned teachers that you were with them sharing this advice and, and experience and you're what an ambassador uh, of the National Educational Association, Read Across America. Talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, it's been really fun. NEA went through a large transition where they moved away from, you know, media that was centered around Dr. Seuss, which for a lot of teachers, they weren't comfortable with, they weren't ready for, which is understandable. You know, it's the same thing that oftentimes we get stuck in tradition and we don't look at and try to think critically about what that tradition actually means. You know, uh, like the same thing with, you know, figures that use native people as their mascots and things of that sort. We often love these things as what they mean for our lives, but we don't think about the impact they have on the people they make fun of, they're, you know, speaking negatively against or the stereotypes. So I was, I was happy to see that they made that decision. And I didn't know I was going to be a part of the team when they did that. But then they reached out to me and said that they were interested in focusing on uh, Black girls' stories this time. And, and I just thought that was really cool. Because there are actually more books that are published about fictional characters and animals than there are Black girls for young children's literature. So it's yeah. been so great to see that they're prioritizing that new story and to work with Black authors and illustrators where I don't know that many Black illustrators, and to meet them uh, and hopefully maybe have an opportunity to work with them in the future on something. Yeah, and, and uh, have the numbers of books uh, increased dramatically? I mean, my experience of it is that many of my friends who are writing children's books who are Black women and Black men are having the opportunity now, but is that the way you experience it as well? Has it grown 
you know, as much as you expected? And a lot of it is because of the work that, uh, you know, that you yourself are doing. I think it has, I think it hasn't grown enough. I am extremely grateful for the, the people that have been, feel encouraged to author books and tell these stories. But the issue has never been with the actual authoring and writing of these books. The issue has been with the publications that green light and pay equally these books. That is where the issue really lies is that, you know, publishing houses are the gatekeepers to where these stories go. And that's the reason why I published my book with Scholastic is because I wanted to end up in every school, you know, every Scholastic school in the country. I wanted to have that access. And if we aren't, you know, making sure that publishing houses are paying people equitably, giving them the opportunity to pitch their books and, you know, colleges and universities and, and you know, having information online that allows people to know that process because people don't know the process. So they might write the greatest book ever that we've never seen and never read and didn't see at our bookstores. So for me, it, I've always felt that authors have been so supportive of my work, but the publishers are not always doing what they can to make sure that the stories get out there. Well, fortunately, several friends of the show have now moved into executive editor, managing editor positions in the publishing houses. So hopefully that will, will change quickly. So I want to talk about the things that you have produced, your, your own book, your own t television show, and who knows what else. Uh, I was saying to you, the Netflix show is just phenomenal. It is, it is so well produced. Talk to us about how and you're the executive producer. <laughs> I tell me that your dad also has a role in, you know, in that. But at any rate, even if he doesn't, you know, he's he's coming along, right? He's making his contribution. He's, but a, he's show... a cheerleader for sure. <laughs> he's, he does his best. He's always, I mean, it's, it's my mom. My mom and I were really, you know, instrumental in that because this is a COVID world and we film that show in uh, a process of less than a week of me just, you know, I went through and I had my, I introduced the show and I helped come up with the ideas and pick the books, but I am the first face they see and I have to be energetic. I have to be exciting. I have to, you know, think about how my hair, my clothes, whatever, because you have to appeal to kids, but you also yeah. have to be not so silly that parents will watch it too, because it was important, especially for the end of the show where there's questions that parents will ask their kids that they actually feel engaged in that discussion. Because you don't want it to just be one kid watching on an iPad. You want it to be a family watching it on their television. Well, well, I agree that it's so well done that, you know, while I my grandchildren, I'm interested in it for them to be watching it. I love it. It is so fantastic. <laughs> Thank, you. So, Thank so, you. So you have another viewer, slightly older than-, than We probably. need all of them. I, I <laughs> always appreciate it. And I, I love to see that grandparents are doing it because my, um, when, I, when I was able to announce that I was doing the show, it was so difficult to explain to my grandparents what Netflix is because they don't <laughs> understand. And it's completely understandable why they might not get it, but like they don't understand the idea that uh, TV could be on a computer and that there is no channel. And that just it completely blew my, gra my grandmother's mind. And it, it makes me happy to think that they can now see it whenever I see them and watch it and show them but they didn't understand it in the first place. And having episodes on YouTube and Netflix is just one way that we can try to get adults to connect and understand it. Because I, I could see how it's a huge transition for my grandma to get what was even going on. But she was proud of me even when she heard, when she heard the word TV, she was already happy enough and she didn't you care to, about you it. Have, you have to bring us along, you know, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get there slowly. Now my grandchildren have your book, but Marley gets it done and so can you. And you published that in 2018. So they both are, you know, you set a very high bar though. So. <laughs> I know, I, I, I know I have. I think I'm always trying to, uh, you know, do whatever I can. I don't think many people were expecting Netflix and I wasn't expect. I probably was the number one did not expect Netflix out of every single person. I, my mom was like, yeah, maybe this could happen in the future. She did probably two years before we filmed this. I was like, they don't care. Why, why, why would they care? And to now see that we had, you know, black costume designers, black directors, uh, black DPs and producers, it just makes me really, really happy to think that there's an environment being built that, you know, will live beyond me because there, I'm pushing for a lot of things to happen and to change, but I don't just want the world to be great for my experience or for my campaign. I want them to be great for all kinds of kids and creatives and producers that want to tell these stories. Um, and it's important that you know, these things exist just beyond what I care about and my goals, because I don't know everything and I don't have every experience. So 
uh, just doing what I can, you know, it makes me happy and proud of what Netflix has been able to accomplish. Yeah, that's great. Usually that's the language you hear from much older people who are talking about their legacy, you know, what am I <laughs> Yes, the, the well, legacy I'm question. <laughs> Marley is already speaking about her legacy. It's fantastic. So uh, I, I looked at a, a, a video of you speaking at a Black Lives Matter ra uh, rally, uh, Black Lives Matter. Talk to us about that. And, and you know, you're so young, uh, but a lot of kids are very much engaged in this. And your, your speech to them, uh, you know, the first thing you mentioned was your hair. You know, look at my hair. I'm here. I'm real. This is me and I have the right to speak and a, the right to have an opinion. Black Lives Matter! I am here as a reminder of that. My hair is a reminder of that. My skin is a reminder of that. And all of you are a reminder of that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely... Uh, the Black Lives Matter rally is it's always such an interesting experience to talk about and to think about because I had often been very secular about my what I do with 1000 Black Girl Books and what happens in my town. That, you know, I don't often try to push for my own curriculum to change because I because these people, they interact with me every day. They don't always understand how hard I'm working, what I do outside of school. And it can be so difficult because it's so personal. It feels like they're right to my face. And even when I didn't, even when 1000 Black Girl Books started, I didn't tell my teacher immediately that I found a problem with his books because I was scared. I was nervous. He knows who I am. He knows my parents. I don't want to be in trouble. But if it's on the internet, if it's the strangers I never met, sure, I can be funny and outgoing and whatever because they don't know everything about me and I don't feel like they're going to invade my space or jeopardize my safety in any way. So when I was introduced by some of my friends in my high school to speak, that wasn't as, you know, Marley of the 1000 Black Girl Books campaign. And that was just as Marley Dias, who does the 1000 Black Girl Books campaign. And right. that is, it was really nervous. It's probably the most nervous I've ever been because I was speaking to people that I go to school with. I was speaking to my friends' crushes. I was speaking to my teachers. Like, it's just such a different, ex it felt like such a different experience. But after watching it, I realized that it is the same and that I have to get over the fear that there is somehow a difference between what happens in my personal life and my public life. Because if I am not being outspoken in my own community, if I'm not willing to put in the work there, then I can't preach and say to other kids to be brave, to be confident, because I still struggle with that same nervousness. So okay. it was definitely something that I, I maybe avoided doing in the past and I might have not done. But seeing the state of the world and how you know, just personally upset I was, I felt that, you know, I had to overcome that, which is something that I had been really struggling with for a long time. Right. Well, we should say the name of the show is Bookmarks, right, on Netflix. Yes, Bookmarks for all Celebrating of, Black Voices, yes. Right, for all of you other grandmothers out there who are looking for something <laughs> to watch, we can all watch Marley, uh, if we can get on Netflix. What are you reading now? What's What do you recommend? I just read a book called The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which is not a black girl book. So I am going to recommend it either way. But I think, it, and the reason why I'll mention that first is because I, I think that people get very caught up in the tagline of my campaign or hearing a one sentence thing that I'm not interested in hearing about the stories of other people, which is far, far, far from the truth. So that's the most recent book that I read. Um, but before that, I read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, this uh, cool, uh, which just blew, completely blew me away because I was too young to read it when it was getting recommended to me or, or my mom at least felt I was too young to read it. And now I wish I'd read it earlier. I felt like I was late. But um, I, I always recommend, you know, a slew of books because I want people to know that this is about recognizing and valuing Black girl stories, but it's also being open to and caring about the experiences of others. That I'm not going to, oh, sorry. Yeah. Right, no, no, and finding you online, because I know we're, we're running out of time, but I want to, uh, people are going to watch bookmarks on Netflix, and how else are they going to read your books, uh, you know, telling kids how to get to it, and also I will tell you that I just asked my daughter about the bluest eye for our 12-year-old <laughs> granddaughter, and she said, maybe it's a little too soon, but now maybe you Maybe later, I guess, I, I think it's, I think it's 14, I think it's after your 14. first year of high school, I think you should read it, that's what I would recommend. You are so good, so where do, where do people find you, and what's next for you? You can find me at, I, uh, at I am Marley Dias on social media, and marleydias.com. 
And what's next for me, we have collected uh, over 500 books over the course of the pandemic through the help of teachers, students, everyday people, and publishing houses. And it's been really, really great. So my mom will be traveling to donate those books to Jamaica during Jamaica Education Week later in uh, the year and summer. Um, and it's going to be really, really fun. I won't be able to travel just given the, the world that we're living in right now. But it is such a blessing. And it's been really, really cool. Oh, well, and talking about being really, really cool, you are really, really cool. So I, I thank you so much for everything that you've done. I don't, you don't have to worry about your legacy. It's set in stone. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that you're encouraging other Black girls to do the same thing is just so wonderful. Uh, and I thank you so much for being with us today. Thank uh, you. It's been so, you're, so fun. You are, you are terrific. And thank you all for watching out there. I'm Carol Jenkins. The show is Black America, and we will see you the next time.